and turn with me, if you will, back to that portion of text which we read just a few moments ago in the book of Leviticus. We're in Leviticus chapter 25 and looking at verse 10. A very important day today, a day that there is great fear and trepidation all over this country that something else bad might happen. Well, we know that something bad is going to happen. We do not know whether it be today or the future. But we know that for those who have not placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, there will be a very bad eternity. There were perhaps, and sadly so, many who died on September 11, 2001, who plunged not merely into the flames of the fire of the World Trade Centers or the Pentagon in Washington or the crash of Flight 93, but plunged into the flames of eternity. Ten years ago, on this date, our nation was rattled to the core. As two planes slammed into the twin towers of the World Trade Center, another slammed into the Pentagon, and a fourth with an obvious destination in Washington, D.C., crashed into the sleepy Pennsylvania countryside as brave passengers tried to regain control from the hijackers. They were led by a courageous young Christian man whose words still echo to us today. Let's roll. More than our civil liberty was under attack on that day. The Christian roots of the United States of America was under attack by a competing fanatical religion that has suppressed billions of people worldwide 
and throughout history has murdered countless millions in its wake of destruction, cruelty, and oppression. Not long after those attacks, on September 11th, our nation was then hit with biological warfare and the anthrax attacks, which killed both postal workers and civilians. President Bush resolutely declared the opening of Operation Freedom, formed a coalition of international military force, and we watched as the so-called shock and awe rolled across much of the Middle East and into Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and their neighboring territories. Sadly, our president declared over and over that we were not making war on Islam, but we were making war on evil. But evil in this case had a definite face, and it was the face of Islam unmasked and full of bloodthirsty hate against Christianity and the West, which was the result of Christianity. Its followers were merely being logically consistent and obedient to the text of the Quran to kill, quote, unbelievers and to conquer the world in the name of Muhammad. But why the attack on the United States? Why the special hatred for this country? Why would the minions of the Prince of Darkness want to attack America, the land of the free, and the home of the brave? I think the answer to that question lies close by us, in fact, just across the river, cast in bronze and placed where all the world can see it. On the Liberty Bell in Philadelphia, we read these words, Proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. That quotation is taken from Leviticus 25.10, which we read a moment ago, and I'll read it again. And ye shall hallow the fiftieth year, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you, and ye shall return every man unto his possession, and ye shall return every man unto his family. It is of the highest importance for us to understand that our founding fathers took their concept of liberty from the Bible. It is not insignificant that they did not choose the secular concept of liberty. They did not quote the murderers of the French Revolution who chanted liberty, equality, fraternity. They did not quote the ancient writers who viewed liberty as available to citizens only if they would worship Caesar as their god. Oh, it's true, the Romans were free to worship any other gods they chose, but the state had to be their principal god. And the early Christians who would not burn a pinch of incense to Caesar were put to death. Our founders did not inscribe the Liberty Bell with a quotation from Buddha, or Mohammed, or Confucius. Those men do not know biblical liberty. Our founders knew that the only stable base upon which to build a nation where true freedom existed was to build it upon the Bible. As we remember the events of September 11, 2001, and as we once again celebrate our freedom on this Patriots Day weekend, we do so with the full awareness that there are many nations in the world today that have no freedom such as we know it. More than 80% of the population of the world falls under the totalitarian control in countries that are communist, Muslim, Buddhist, Hindu, Roman Catholic, atheist, and secular dictatorships. But it seems as we move through this day that our nation has forgotten the true source of liberty. David says in Psalm 119.45, I will walk at liberty for I seek thy precepts. Only a nation that seeks the word of God, that understands the word of God, that believes the word of God, that earnestly desires the word of God to be incorporated into their being will ever have liberty. I will walk at liberty for I seek thy precepts. The empowerment for liberty is not merely pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps, not bearing American its spirit, but it is the spirit of the Lord. Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 61.1, The spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the broken heart, hearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. 
quoted by our Lord Jesus Christ as he speaks of himself as the one who brings that liberty. It is the Spirit of the Lord. He is the one who gives liberty. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Every other form of liberty will ultimately be destroyed. Every other form of liberty will be crushed. Every other form of liberty will be corrupted. But where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But nations can walk away from their roots. Nations can drift from the principles of their founding fathers, and the United States has done that. And we find ourselves dangerously close to the point of judgment. Psalm 917 tells us the wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. That is a serious warning to the United States. Blessing comes to the nation who places its faith in the true God. Psalm 33, 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. If we want blessing on our nation, we must pray that God will turn us back to himself. That our people will begin to trust the one who is the source of true liberty, and the only word that he has given us whereby liberty is proclaimed and whereby it is found. I will walk at liberty for I seek thy precepts. You see, national repentance and turning to the Lord is necessary for his continued blessing and for continued liberty. Jeremiah 34, 8, this is the word that came unto Jeremiah from the Lord after that the king Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people which were at Jerusalem to proclaim liberty unto them. God sent his word saying, yes, I will give you liberty because you have made a covenant with me. I will give you liberty because you have turned back as a nation to me. And he sent Jeremiah the prophet to declare it. Jeremiah 34, 15, and now you returned and had done right in my sight in proclaiming liberty every man to his neighbor and you made a covenant before me in the house which is called by my name. O oh, people, Peter tells us judgment begins at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what will be the end of those who don't believe? We need to make sure that our hearts are right. We need to turn back to God here in this place. We need to make sure that our gods are not the gods of materialism and self-indulgence and worldliness and flesh. But that our one true God is the Lord. Oh, how easy it is to set up the idol of covetousness as idolatry even in the lives of Christians. We want personal peace and affluence, as Francis Schaeffer said, but we have forgotten the Lord our God. Our Lord Jesus Christ, quoting that verse that we read just a moment ago out of Isaiah, in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are abused. Friends, only the Lord Jesus Christ can give us true liberty. If you have not Christ, you have not liberty. No matter how much money you have, no matter how much freedom of travel you have, no matter how many things you can buy and do what you will when you want to, you have no liberty but you are still in bondage, the bondage of sin, the bondage of self, the bondage of rebellion. For Christ is the one who sets at liberty them that are bruised. Romans chapter 8 verse 21 tells us that this entire world is under the crushing bondage of sin. But there is coming a day at the return of our Lord Jesus Christ when all of creation shall be delivered from that bondage. And Paul writes, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Those who are Christ's are the only ones who have true liberty. 
whether they are free to roam as we are here in this country, or whether they are in a prison cell because of their faith, they are the ones who have true liberty. But liberty is not license. Many people think that, ah, I have liberty, I can do what I want. No, liberty is given to us so that we can do what we ought. True freedom is not the right to do what the flesh forces you to do. True liberty is freedom from the bondage of sin. True liberty is being able to do the things that God has designed you to do. You've heard me give the illustration in the past. A plane is really, truly at liberty only when it's doing what it was designed to do. It takes off and it flies. And it can fly over mountains, it can fly over cities, it can fly over rivers. It is not stopped, it is flying. It would be very hard for that plane to start in Washington, D.C. and ride on the roads all the way to Los Angeles. It would not be at liberty because it's not doing what it was designed to do. A toothbrush is designed for brushing teeth, not for hammering nails. You try to hammer nails with a toothbrush and you break the toothbrush and you do not get the nail hammered. It's at liberty when it's doing what it was designed to do. And you, as a son and daughter of Adam, were designed to glorify the living God of creation. And when you are not doing what you are designed to do, you are in the bondage of sin. You are not free. True liberty comes only to those who are doing what God designed them to do. Liberty is not license. Paul explains this in Romans chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Oh, how we want to insist on our rights. And yet when we insist on our rights, instead of doing what glorifies God, we cause a stumbling block to another brother or sister in Christ. He goes on and says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 29, Conscience I say not thine own, but of the other, for why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? Yes, we do restrict our freedom for the sake of weaker brothers. You think something is okay for you to do, and yet you know that it causes another brother or sister to stumble. It causes a child to stumble. It causes a brand new Christian to stumble then it is not true liberty. What you are doing is you are sinning against a weaker brother in Christ. First Peter chapter 2. Peter picks up the theme and says, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Liberty is not license. True freedom is not an excuse to use your liberty for maliciousness, to do something evil to harm someone else. Christianity is totally unlike Islam. Islam says it's perfectly all right to lie if it furthers the purpose of Islam. It's all right to cheat and certainly okay to kill because if you do that in a jihad, you suddenly have this immense paradise filled with virgins that you have uh, horrible relations with all the time. Uh, wicked, 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 wicked doctrine. That's not Christianity. Peter explains it here as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. True freedom is being a servant of God. True freedom is taking the position as our Lord Jesus Christ did when he knelt before the feet of his apostles, his disciples, and washed their feet at the Last Supper. He took the position of a servant. There's freedom in that. Oh, the world has it exactly upside down. Liberty of the spirit comes before any bodily liberty becomes meaningful. Unless you are free inside, external liberty means nothing. Galatians 2.4 We find here that Paul is warning about those who are coming in to steal their freedom in Christ. And he says that because false brethren unawares were brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage. There is bondage to sin, but we have liberty from that in Christ. There is bondage to the law. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, you see, as the Apostle Paul writes the book of Galatians, he knew that these churches of Galatia had been infiltrated by people who were telling them that they had to keep the law to be saved and they had to keep the law to be sanctified. 
But Jesus Christ is the end of the law for them that have believed. It doesn't mean we are lawless. It doesn't mean that we are licentious. We've already spoken of that. Liberty is not license, but liberty is also not legalism. There is a balance in the Christian life whereby we are controlled by the Spirit of God, not merely the flesh, trying to keep the law. No one can keep the law in the flesh. The law condemns us. The Apostle Paul said, I did a really good job of it, except when it came to that point, thou shalt not covet. And then he said, the law slew me. And Paul was really, really, really good. He was the strictest of the Pharisees. And yet he couldn't keep the law. Dear folks, it's only as the Spirit of God dwells in you. It's only as the Holy Spirit empowers you. It's only as the Holy Spirit directs you and gives you understanding of Scripture that you begin to live in His power and all things become right as you walk through life. You do the will of your Father, which is in heaven. And that's why Paul writes, False brethren unawares were brought in who came in privily to spy at our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us unto bondage. Yes, there is a law of liberty, and James writes of it, James 1.25, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. And he goes on and explains us that the law of liberty is the law of love. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor, as the Apostle Paul explains. When we have the genuine love of our Lord Jesus Christ inside of us and flowing through us, we do what is good for our neighbor. Our Lord Jesus told us the greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And the second is like unto it, we shall love our neighbor as ourselves. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. We're not talking about human love. We're not talking about the stuff that comes out of Hollywood. We're not talking about even just, you know, generous benevolence that... Uh, benefactors give in the secular world to their favorite charity. We're talking about the kind of love that Christ had for us. The kind of love that brought him to Calvary's cross. The kind of love that the Holy Spirit now, as you are a believer, enables you to have. It's part of the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. But they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts thereof. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. We're not talking about walking in the flesh. We're not talking about pulling ourselves up with our bootstraps. We're talking about walking in the power of God's Spirit because otherwise you cannot have or express the kind of love of which James is speaking here, the law of liberty, which is the law of love. True liberty is freedom from sin and from legalism. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. For, brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Galatians 5, 1 and 13. But you see... There are those who would lie to you about what liberty is. Well, they're all around us. You see it as you walk through the checkout stand at Walmart or at Walgreens or at your favorite grocery store. It's plastered on these little racks that are right there for people to stare at as they are standing in line with nothing else to do. That is not love. That is not liberty. To be able to do what you want with whoever you want. True liberty is freedom from sin and from legalism. Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same he is brought into bondage. Peter writes that of the apostates who creep into the church who try to bring immorality in the church. Sometimes they bring it subtly through the things that they teach. Sometimes they bring it overtly through the kind of music that they play on the stage and the flashing lights and the wiggling bodies and all the horrendously bad stuff that goes on in so-called evangelical churches. They promise them liberty, 
You're free to do what you want. You're free to be who you want. Dress like you want. Talk like you want. Think like you want. It doesn't matter. You've been forgiven in Christ. Do whatever you want. Dear friends, that's the word of an apostate. Someone who wants to get you entangled in bondage. They promise them liberty while they themselves are the servants of corruption for of whom a man is overcome of the same he is brought into bondage. Did you know there's also liberty of judgment? Jeremiah speaks of that. We quoted him a few moments ago in terms of the covenant the people make with their God and thus get liberty. But he tells us something else if they turn their backs on that proclamation of liberty. Wherefore thus saith the Lord, ye have not hearkened unto me in proclaiming liberty. Every one to his brother and every man to his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim a liberty for you, saith the Lord, to the sword, to the pestilence, and to the famine. And I will make you to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. There's the reverse to that great promise of liberty when in fact you do not turn to the Lord for your liberty, where you find your liberty somewhere else, he says, all right, I will proclaim a liberty for you, saith the Lord, to the sword, to the pestilence, and to the famine. And I will make you to be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. Dear people, sometimes I fear for our country that we may be on the brink of the liberty of judgment. James 2.12, So speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. The exhortation for us as believers, because judgment is pending, is to watch. You see, God is still a God of judgment against nations who forget Him. Nations who revel in their sins. But we are to walk by faith and to watch and to be warned by faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by which he condemned the world and became heir to the righteousness which is by faith. And Peter tells us that he and his wife and three sons were delivered, speaking of the flood, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing for in few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. God is a God of judgment not only on the world but upon the angelic world as well. He has judged individuals, He has judged nations, He has judged the angels. For if God spared not the angels that sinned but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment and spared not the old world but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. And oh, here's one that describes our nation today and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. Folks, these words were written for the United States of America, a nation that has forgotten for the most part the God who made them, forgotten where their liberty came from, forgotten that our country was founded on liberty declared in the Scripture, proclaimed liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. When our founding fathers put that on the liberty bell, they did it specifically because it was written in the Bible. They could have made up a quaint saying to put on the liberty bell. They did not. Instead, they quoted the eternal word of God. They cast it in bronze for us, and we still see it today. And some of you probably have seen it within the last six months. There's where our freedom is found. It's found in those who delight themselves in their precepts, in God's precepts, the first verse that we read today. Those who have turned to Christ, those who have the true and living God. Those who base their lives and their countries upon the Bible. The nation that forgets God will know that their sins are worthy of the death penalty, but they will laugh at God. They will continue to enjoy their depravity. Romans 1.32, Who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Oh, I know we're moving toward the end of the age. I know that we're moving toward the times described in the book of Revelation, where men know that it is God who is sending the judgments, but they refused to repent. The rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands. 
for they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor their sorceries, nor their fornication, nor of their thefts. It says the men were scorched with a great heat, but they blasphemed the name of God, which have power over these plagues. They repented not to give him glory. We've just experienced, over the last several weeks, a little tiny touch of the hand of God. An earthquake down in Washington. Uh, we find hurricanes coming in and doing some damage. And Yet you know that they're not as bad as some hurricanes that we've had that could do a lot more damage. God is warning America. Your people, this is our nation. And God has put us here to pray for this nation. This is our nation and we have our eyes open by the word of God to be able to see his hand. And yet we are not repenting of our evil ways. We are not crying out before the living God that he would forgive us for our sins. We are not petitioning heaven that God would spare our land and make us the witnesses to this land that we should be. God has not sent you to China. He has not sent you to Indonesia. He has not sent you to Africa, though some of you have been there and served him there. He has sent you now to the United States of America. This is our land. And God has put us as his witnesses here in this place not somebody else and not someplace else. We are it for good or for bad. That's what God has done for the Christians who are here in this country. Oh, that it might be for good and not for bad. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing and the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed? Oh, we see that in Washington today saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. You know what God's response is? He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. He shall speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Do we want that to happen to our nation? The United States has forgotten God. That's why we must pray for our nation. Tonight, after the audiovisual presentation on 9-11, I'll be preaching first out of the book of Acts. The service will be shorter. I'm not sure how much shorter my sermon will be, but we'll only have a hymn, and then we'll go right into the, well, so that the trustees don't worry, we'll have the offering, and then we'll go, uh, go into the message. But immediately after that, we have a presentation on 9-11. And following that, we're going to spend some time, as we should, as a congregation, praying for our country. Perhaps the the visual images will wake again in your mind that we are not merely in civil warfare between nations. We are in a spiritual warfare whereby Satan has used those under his control to attack not merely our country but the Christian roots of our country. And God has placed us here as a witness for 200 years to reach the world for Christ. And Satan hates it. That'll be tonight. I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority that we might lead quiet and peaceable lives in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Do you want to do something that is good and acceptable in the sight of God your Savior? Then pray for those in authority. We'll have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 5. The key to national repentance are the prayers of God's people. The prayers of God's people. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. One final thought. The theme of this message 
has been true freedom. The land of the free. What is the land of the free? It's a land that desires the precepts of God's word. It's a land whereby the Holy Spirit is at work in the hearts of the people. It's a land whereby people believe the word of God and obey it. It's a land that has the Lord Jesus Christ at its center. These final thoughts from the Gospel of John and from the Book of Romans. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. If you do not have the truth, you are not free. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In John 8, 36, Jesus says, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. And Paul echoes that in Romans 8, 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for your powerful word that proclaims to us over and over and over and over again that your word is truth and it's the truth that makes us free and that Jesus Christ is the truth and it's Jesus Christ who makes us free and that freedom comes not with pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps but by the empowering of the Spirit of God where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And we know Satan hates that. He would destroy it if he could. But the Lord Jesus Christ told us what a great promise. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Father, I pray that everyone in this room has that true liberty that comes only in Christ. The freedom that comes when we know that our sins are forgiven by the blood of the cross. The freedom that comes when we know that it doesn't matter what men do unto us. The eternal living God has given us eternal life. Father, we pray that you will take this your word as it has been proclaimed this day. That it would not return unto you void, but that it would accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.